Welcome to Love, Money, and the Law. My name is Cindy Hyde, and our subject is Sperm Banks and In Vitro Fertilization, the State of Affairs in the United States. My guest today is Tabitha Charlton. She's giving her personal story and also some insights into the state of affairs in this country, particularly in Texas. So tell us first how you became familiar with the subject of in vitro fertilization. So I have twin girls who were conceived using in vitro fertilization and a sperm bank. And you are here to share a little bit about the state of affairs with respect to what's happening in this industry. So it's my understanding that the entire industry is not regulated, correct? Outside of some uh, the Food and Drug Administration, they have some policies in place that require um, disease testing, mm -hmm. but beyond that, there's really no regulation in the United States of sperm banks. If I'm interested in having this process done, first of all, explain what it exactly means. What is in vitro fertilization, number one? Right, so, well, first of all, you can use um, a sperm bank. Um, you don't always have to do in vitro fertilization, so you, um, I have friends who have purchased sperm from a sperm bank, and they've become pregnant at home. Um, you can have the sperm sent to you at home. Some sperm banks will mail it to you in the, in the tank to your home. Some require that you go through a physician. Um, in vitro fertilization specifically is where, you know, I had a procedure where they harvested my eggs, they extracted them, then they, in a petri dish, they put the sperm and the egg together, and then they stay in the petri dress, uh, dish for five days, some three days, five days, seven days, and then they transfer them back once they've de determined which ones are viable. All right, so the first thing you have to do is pick the sperm donor. Right? Yes. So that's where the sperm bank selection comes in, first of all. So how did you go about finding a sperm bank that, you, first of all, you wanted to work with and that you felt comfortable uh, with respect to who the donor, donor was? Right, so I, um, well Google, first of all, I started there, um, but I had, uh, once I started reading about the process and learning w how sperm banks work and what your options are, um, I narrowed my choices down to three different sperm banks. What was important to me is that I wanted to work with a sperm bank that offered donor release, um, ID release donors, and that means generally that the donors are willing to be known or at least to have the sperm bank provide their contact information upon the child's 18th birthday. And so I thought that was important. If my daughters decide not to contact the donor, that's their prerogative, but at least I'm giving them the choice. Um, I wanted it to be their decision whether they wanted to make that contact, and so that was important to me. But then I also, it was important that uh, the sperm bank that they had donors available that fit the criteria I was searching for. It was very important to me that a donor, because I'm an only parent, um, I wanted my children to feel like they belong to my family and they resemble us, so I picked a donor who shared the characteristics of both of my parents. So talk a little bit about that process. I mean, what does that mean? When you pick a donor, do you look in a book? Do you go through, I mean, do you, you, see, you see some history about this person? And right. how do you know that's even valid? Well, <laughs> That's one of the issues that we have um, in this country, um, that, that we don't know that it's valid. We, we hope that it is, um, but so the process... So, let me stop you there. So, when someone is donating sperm, they'll go to a sperm bank mm -hmm. and I'm assuming fill out some information about themselves, but is that verified or not? It depends on the sperm bank. And to a great extent, no, it's not. Um, they can say anything they like about their parents' characteristics, their siblings' characteristics, even really, for that matter, where they, if they're educated, if they received a degree, um, what their personality traits are. Um, a good sperm bank will spend some time with that donor getting to know them and, and will also try to verify their degrees and things like that, but mm -hmm. certainly it's not required. Um, there's no legislation, there are no statutes or laws in place that require the sperm banks to do that. So you're kind of a hope and a prayer. <laughs> so that's part of um, the criteria, I guess you would say, that it, because there's no regulation, you're really never 100% sure right. about the donor that you're selecting. It's completely a subjective and optional with respect to the information they provide. Right, and so that was one of the other criteria that was important to me is that I wanted to be able to see photographs of the donor um, at different stages of life. And if 
possible, have an audio recording. Um, I wanted as much information about the donor as I could possibly acquire. Um, and, that, and that varies between sperm banks. It is does. That right? It okay. does. And so um, the um, the sperm bank that I ultimately chose is located in another state. They're in Georgia, mm -hmm. and they did provide um, they they provided all of the information. They I have chosen a, a donor, an identity release donor. Um, I was able to see photographs of him. Um, from baby all the way to college age, mm -hmm. um, which is the age he was when he was donating. Mm -hmm. And um, he did not have an audio recording, but he wrote a story, a personal essay about his life and why he chose to become a donor. So there was a lot of information uh, that he provided that I felt like um, gave me some comfort in who he was. Mm -hmm. um, there's certainly been instances um, and cases where donors provided information and that information ultimately turned out to be incorrect. Um, and so that's always a concern when you're working in, uh, I mean, these are our children and that's why it's so important that, it, that we have some regulations in place. So are there any limitations with respect to how many, uh, how much of a sperm can be used in, for other prospective parents? No, not in the United States. Many countries do regulate uh, the number of families per donor. The United States does not. So, so in your case, what's happened? Can you say a little bit about your personal circumstances? Sure. So when I purchased uh, the vials in the fall of 2009, there was a reported pregnancy but no reported births as of yet. Um, that's another issue is that in the United States you're not required to report a birth. There's no requirement. So if the sperm banks are only recounting the births that are reported to them, mm -hmm. there could be countless other births that are not reported. So at the time I purchased in the fall of 2009, there were no reported births. My children were not conceived until three years later in the fall of 2012. And by then, we had already just about reached the maximum that the bank had given me. I think actually we had reached the maximum that the sperm bank had given to those of us who had already had children or were in the process of having children giving mm -hmm. birth. And so um, again, you come back to that issue of counting. Um, today, I was originally told 18 was the limit. Uh, today, just in the group that I'm part of, um, of the mothers who are willing to be known and we've divorced, we've created this group of of donor siblings whom we call Diblings. Mm -hmm. There are approximately 40 families in our group and just With over 60 donor. kids. Yes. So how did you find each other? I mean on Facebook, but how do you, how do you go about even beginning to find? I, again, I go back to Google. <laughs> um, I Googled my donor's ID number and it brought me to the donor sibling registry. So there is such a thing? Yes. Okay. Yes. and. Um, so they are, and is that a voluntary? It is. It uh, was not started by any of the sperm banks. Okay. So none of the sperm banks participate in that necessarily. Not that registry. Right. Not necessarily. So. Okay. So the only way of really knowing is independently. Right? Mm -hmm. My sperm bank has since developed um, a portal where you can sign in and those mm -hmm. who are willing to have their name and identity released. Mm -hmm. um, we can log in and, and see that information. Mm -hmm. um, and also, the donor could choose to have his identity released before our children turn 18. So what are some of the advantages or disadvantages with disclosure of this particular issue? I mean, on both sides. Right. I think um, for, the, for my daughter's sake, I think it was really important to me that they had the opportunity to be able to identify the other half of their DNA to know where they came from, some of their traits. Obviously, they're not 100% me. So they they already, they're only five, um, and I already see things that, like, that doesn't remind me of mm -hmm. anyone in my family, you know? Where did she get that? And so I think that was a big part, is I, I wanted, I never wanted them to feel like there was half of them, half of themselves was missing or, mm -hmm. you know, not be able to identify with someone. And I knew the donor would not, at the earliest, be identified until they were 18. So it was really important to me when I found out that there were diblings that we make that connection. And it's been wonderful being able to watch all of the kids who are close in age. Mm -hmm. um, they're all within you know, four or five years um, apart to be able to watch them grow and share characteristics and learn things. Um, for instance, my daughter was born with congenital ptosis, with, which is an issue like it looks like um, sleepy eye, mm -hmm. you know, where an eyelid wouldn't lift. Well, it turns out some of the other kids in the group 
were also born, you know, and that's not a noted in the donor's uh, profile. He's probably not something he was aware of, um, and we can't say for certain that that came from him, but it, it is a coincidence that several of the children share. Mm -hmm, that is a coincidence. You have here as a note, aside from the FDA's regulation that sperm banks perform contagious disease testing, yes. the United States has no national laws regulating sperm, egg, or embryo donation. Correct. There are no laws requiring genetic testing, limiting the number of families per donor, preventing anonymity of donors, requiring families to report live births or anything else. Right. I mean, these are serious issues and something that uh, you might not even think about to ask. So I think this you know, conversation is very important to highlight some of the potential problems even right. in, in uh, doing research when you're looking for a donor. So Yeah, well you can imagine if you have um, just in our group of the children we are aware of when you're talking about over 60 kids, um, and an interesting thing to note about our particular group mm -hmm. is, you know, we have approximately 40 families and all but one, maybe two of the families mm -hmm. are either only moms, single parent moms, mm -hmm. um, or they are lesbian couples. Mm -hmm. And so there's a tendency for opposite sex couples who use donors to not disclose. And so if we're already at over 60 kids with 40 families, and we are aware because the mm -hmm. bank has told us there are more families, mm -hmm. you know, we're thinking that we're probably well over 70 families and we could be close to 100 children at this point with wonder, our one donor. I wonder why there's such a big difference between same-sex couples and opposite sex, sex couples who are having in vitro or using sperm banks with respect to disclosure. That makes no sense. I'm sure every, every couple's journey and story is unique to their situation. I only have a point of reference of, of one friend um, mm -hmm. and, and their, it was a very personal decision for them and it was a very difficult decision um, for her and her husband uh, to use a sperm donor and so they've elected not to tell their friends and family that they've used a donor. They will mm -hmm. tell their child um, when it's age appropriate. Um, so obviously, no one knowing, they would not want to be part of our group. They would not be attending the Dibbling annual reunion that we're going to in New York in August. Okay. Um, because they've chosen not, you know, not to disclose. So is there anything else that you would like to include in our conversation that we haven't talked about yet that might be uh, a benefit to someone who's considering this procedure? Well, I think it's really important um, if you are going to use a sperm donor um, to go through a sperm bank. Um, a lot of folks will use a known donor mm -hmm. and that can be very complicated legally in terms of parental rights and you want to be sure that you hired an attorney and you didn't do any of that on your own. Mm -hmm. um, so I would recommend using a sperm bank just because the legal um, it's less legally complicated. So can you touch on what you needed to do by going through a sperm bank? What are some of the, specifically, the, the legal documents, the things that you needed to get clarity on? Because I'm sure that's that's a thought that you know, right. crosses others' minds about, well, we don't need to go through that whole process, maybe not go to the expense, but what are some of the drawbacks by not doing it, uh, let's say, in a, in a more formal way? Right, so through the sperm bank, you know, all of the legal, everything was handled through the sperm bank. So there, was, mm -hmm. there were no additional steps that I needed to take when my daughters were born. Mm -hmm. So there's no father identified on their birth certificate. When they were three and I went to obtain passports, I didn't have to get parental consent, I was exempt. So I don't have to, re I don't need permission from anyone else. I am their only parent. And so when you use a known donor, it becomes complicated because um, there are parental rights issues in place and you would need to have extensive contracts in place and ultimately you might even be facing a parental rights termination process which is very difficult to do unless you have another partner in place to adopt the child at the same time. Mm -hmm. And so um, 
for someone who is an only parent and does not have someone in place to take over parental rights for that child, I could see some issues potentially propping up in court if you were to want to terminate those parental rights. Lots of issues and lots of expense. So yes. it, in spite of the unregulated nature of the industry, it's there's still a lot of good reasons to go through yes. uh, a formal company Absolutely. That, is, that is their reason for being and so absolutely and, and in a way you know the sperm banks have, have kind of their self-regulated industry in a way they understand that you know for instance my sperm bank did provide significant genetic testing and that was important to me they're not required to by law but they mm -hmm. did that and mm -hmm. you know the the issue of anonymity they did provide donors that were willing to be known and so that you know so there is some measure of regulation uh, self-regulation mm -hmm. they understand what's important to the consumer um, and to the intended parents. And uh, the better sperm banks, the, the more well-known sperm banks, have put some of those procedures in place. Any idea how many sperm banks there are in the country? I, I have no idea. Um, like I said, I, I went with a bank that is located in Georgia. I know some of the more, um, the sperm bank that identifies itself as the largest in the world is located in California. Um, and it might be important to point out, too, that my children, um, the diblings in the family, they are worldwide. So my children have diblings in Australia, Canada, oh. England. Um, yeah, so they're, they are everywhere. Um, and that, I guess, provides a little bit of comfort when I'm thinking about this large number of children <laughs> um, that are the half siblings or diblings, you know, to my own daughters. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a unique story. Um, I think, for the most part, being an only parent and my daughters being conceived the way they were, most people assume that I am divorced and that there's a father in place. Mm -hmm. And so there's an assumption, and so my daughters do get that question quite often. Mm -hmm. um, where's, your where's your father? Or do you have a daddy? Mm -hmm. um, and not understanding the roles of family members and what the different definitions mean. My daughters hear me call my father dad or daddy. Mm -hmm. And so their common answer is, yes, we have a daddy. His name is Papa. <laughs> so, <laughs> You know, it's it's an interesting um, kind of un, uncharted territory in our country, and I, I think that um, it's work it's working for them. So, um, while those of us with children of donors would like to see more regulation in place to protect us and the kids, um, I would definitely recommend using a sperm bank over a known donor or doing it privately. All right, thank you, Tabitha, very much for being here today and sharing a little bit about your story and also giving us some insights into the state of affairs in the United States. And if you would like more information about sperm banks or other issues, uh, you may certainly go to our online resources at Love, Money, and the Law for this video, and you'll find this also in podcasts. Thank you. I'm Cindy Hyde. appreciate you joining us today.